Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 205, 4th of February in 2021. Uh, I hope things are going well for you. Let me go ahead and bring up the actual presentation. There we go. Uh, that recording is going to start funny. I wonder what YouTube is going to give me. Anyway, welcome to the internal workings of these meetings being recorded and posted to YouTube later for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. <sighs> We don't have a lot of different things to cover, but we have possibly some big things to cover. Um, if you're here, go ahead and say hi in the chat. We always like to see or hear from the faces that are here from the faces, hear from the people. None of that works right. Anyway, go ahead and say hi. Uh, we like it. Know that people are watching, hanging out. Um, what are we doing today? We're doing triage because we always do triage. Um, when there's something to triage, and there is. And then um, there was a set of design uh, a list of design discussions that we need to have, uh, but then Sean brought up that he has implemented some of the more um, larger uh, changes in Burn, I'd say, certainly the most Im more impactful ones. And so rather than adding a whole bunch of new design discussions, we're gonna take this time slot and uh, let Sean talk about and walk us through whatever he wants to walk through on this PR so that we can um, check off a large set of things that he's been working on, which is very cool which means we're basically spending our entire day in GitHub. All right. Sound good? All right. I thought so. Bob, you ready? Triage. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. I can't get my mind off of how YouTube's going to try to take the first, you know, five seconds of the slide and create a snapshot of it, and it's going to be the intro screen. Uh, all right. Um, all right. Starting at the top here, these are the oldest ones. Uh, Sean also has figure out a magic trick that allows new issues to automatically be tagged with the um, triage label when using the templates, which is very, very cool, which means things like this old issue that was already tagged with extensions can also be tagged with triage and we can go forward. Um, this should be a preview zero bug, I think is the biggest issue right here, and then getting it done is the other thing. Um, and getting this done will go with the other preview zero of being a software tag. So if we bring this into preview zero, then the matter is just getting it finished, right? Oh yeah, here it is. It's finished. Okay, same as the tag vendor. Right? Yeah. Yep. All right. Great. Preview zero. Give it to me. I will bring this um, near the top. Ta getting the tag was one of the next big things I wanted to tackle because uh, the other ones that I had, we haven't discussed outside of fitness. So, all right. Preview zero. Look at that already. Rollback boundary always discard at the beginning of the chain. This open issue down here is still assigned to me. I still need to do it as I was talking about before the stream. For those of you that got here early or as quick as it was announced on Twitter, you could hear me pontificating on uh, different life with remote schooling. And I need to find a time slice that gets this that I have not done. So I will be so back <laughs> unless you fixed it in this um, uh, PR3, the PR35. Can we put that in preview zero? Oh, yes, definitely. Yep, put it in preview zero. Good call. And assign it to burn. It's not. Or burn. no, this, in the, this is in the binder? Yeah. Probably in the binder. Yeah. Um, all right, we need to document the new minimum OS for Rex V4. I agree with that. Um, Have we decided what it is? I think it's the same as uh, .NET Core 3.1, maybe even .NET Core 5. I don't know if that's different. But I think we kind of hit the point where it's like .NET Core 3.1 matches everything, right? It's like Win 7, SP1, and I always lose track of server. 2008 server R2. Well, you should just open the issue if we're going to talk about it. <laughs> oh, right, because it's all in here. There is the list. So I'm pretty sure .NET Core 3 and 5 had the same support. I did too. Yeah, that's what so. I remembered. Yep. Out of support as of today. But .NET 5 has a different server support than desktop, which is not something we would do. I would, I don't think we would have different support for server versus desktop. No, I don't think so either. The only thing is um, custom actions. I don't think we would do anything in the custom actions to prevent them from running in server 2008 purposefully, but that 
doesn't mean that we're going to you know, really try to make them work, really hard to make them work, like we did for XP in Wix 3X, I guess I'd say. Well, I don't know. So we're talking about Server 2008, not 2008 R2, right? Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, like this right here. Right. It's still an extended until a couple more years. Yeah, two more years-ish. Um, That's the biggest switch is that Server 2008 is Vista era. Um, but, you know, there's no real interest, I think, in supporting Vista. No, not a Vista. Although I don't know what we would be doing that would prevent us from running on Vista. I mean, there's not a big difference between Vista and Win 7 as far as the code we write generally. Um, there are some features like the... MSI multi-transaction stuff that only shows up on Win 7. Um, well, I think, well, so I was looking at that, and because 7 includes 5, MSI 5. Right. Um, there, there was stuff, you know, we had to deal with, like, the taskbar stuff in Win 7 in Wix standard BA. Yeah, but was it different in 7 versus Vista? Oh, I see, we'd have to Vista conditionalize didn't have it. it. We'd have to conditionalize it. By the way, the MSI transaction is in MSI 4.5, which is in Service Pack 2 of Vista in uh, Server 2008. And Server 2008? Oh, okay. okay. I mean, that just simplifies things. I thought I thought .NET 4.5 was um, separate download, but it's good that MSI 4.5. Sorry, MSI. Where did I say .NET 4.5? MSI 4.5. Uh, I thought that was separate, but it's good that it made it into the SP. Um, which means that it's even less to worry about. So I still think we standardize MSIs on, I, I think, I guess here's the question. If someone brought up a bug for server 2008 in burn or the custom actions, because that's the only, I wouldn't care about the core tool set. Um, well, we, I'd, go the, I'd go the extreme opposite. We do not support out of service OS is we don't go uh, ah as build tools we don't go that far back right right not as build tools it's the custom actions and burn that ship with the product that's the right, question exactly yep so it's only those guys um, I don't know I I would say we wouldn't refuse to fix a bug I personally would go uh, okay sure but you know, who cares? Yeah, Server 2008 is really old. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm more interested in like, you know, currently we default the installer version on packages to MSI 5. I yes. think that's I know, think absolutely that's... the right default. Uh, yes. And if you need to support 4 or 5 on Server 2008, go ahead. But right. We're, right. we're not going to dumb down the product to right to match. Totally. Like if you need okay. to go down, we'll, we will absolutely, you can use the waste tool set to build MSIs that target um, XP. Uh, what, are, what, are, what was the first? Uh, Windows 2000. Wherever the Windows installer was, Windows installer 1.0 was first available. Let me use hey, it. we still have conditions in some of the custom actions, version NT greater than equal or equal to 400. Right. So I don't know. We're going to go out of our way to break that, but at the same time, yeah. yeah. So uh, so I guess that's kind of the thing. It's like the tools are going to target Win 7 up, Win 7 SP1 up, um, and we're not going to go out of our way to break Server 2008, but I don't know if we need to do a whole lot more than that. After that, yeah, we need to support all those. And then we need to write this down in the documentation somewhere and make it available. So, so when we write new features, we don't have to care about whether it'll work on Server 2008 or not? I'd say it's fine to target things that are, you know, in. Well, we can have features that only work on certain OSs, if that's your question. As a, as a, you know, opposed to, you know, what this is all open source. So what does it mean to say that you know we support it? It's a best effort, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess. 
It's, but like on burn, we need to block. <laughs> Remember, there's a block in burn that says right now it's XP or newer. It's required. So we need to bump that up. But is it going to get bumped up to 2008 or or Vista or Windows 7, basically? Man, all these OSs are out in 2023. I wonder if that's going to stick. I didn't realize all these numbers are the same. Well, it's because they reset. They they went to the 10-year server plan. Well, 10-year plan in general. Yeah, but they went backwards, too. All the 2008, server 2012. They're all out of service in two years. No, the well, server 2012 is October of 2023, so oh, it's you're right, you're slightly right. different. But... <laughs> One trans, you sure they didn't just transpose those numbers? Um, <laughs> wow, and I like how they leave open the possibility of the extended servicing. Yeah, well, yeah, they haven't done that yet, but all right. Um, so the real question there is do we does burn and the custom actions fail on server 2008? I don't think I don't think we should block until we oh God, until we know that it's not going to work. So, you know, like today, in part because of WI Util, we work on you know MSI before yeah four or five yep, and you know we now now the problem is we've we've done a little bit of work to make that you know possible, but. We've also done, I'm guessing, very little work in terms of validating that we actually run on server 2008. And this comes back to my comment about what does support mean in an open source project. I don't think we should block. Yeah, I don't think we should block the extended security update. If something's still a security update, burn probably shouldn't be blocking it. I think that's probably the answer. If we, if, we, if we fail for some reason, then it's a bug. Yeah, and we can decide whether we're gonna come fix is a different right. question. Yeah. Yeah. So am I hearing we're gonna leave the block alone and wait for someone to come and tell us that it's broken? No, no, no. I think we, we moved the block to up to Vista SP two or whatever whatever this line is here. I mean, I mean that's the block right there. Yeah. Like whatever this twenty twenty oh one fourteen timeline is. But yeah, okay. The block starts here, essentially, and we're going to support whatever is version is supported inside this 2023 number, um, or we're not going to prevent it, right? And then anything that in there, we'll have to go figure out what to do. Now, does that mean that Wix standard BA keeps the conditional logic to handle whether there's a taskbar um, uh, progress? What are those called? A progress indicator inside the taskbar or not? Yeah, we can decide, right? Like, yeah, well, maybe we're standard BA in the end doesn't support Server 2008. But given where we're at and what the way things have been written thus far, I we should be able to keep that extended security update. No reason to block everybody out of something that is still a supported OS for at least another two years, almost two years. Okay. I think that's probably yeah. the line to take. Yeah. Okay. I'm fine with that. All right. So yeah, we're basically doing the same as .NET 5, which was probably the same as .NET 3.1. Well, .NET 5 does not support Oh, they don't go to 2008? Server 2008. Oh, yeah. they don't. I see. So the star was just this, this row. Got it. Okay. They don't .NET 5 support. The data struck out. Oh, no, they don't support, they don't support anything before Server 2012 R2? None on the server side. Wow. Okay. I don't think it affects us. So I, I, on the, uh, we probably should call this out. On the build side, we're not going to go below this because we're, we're not going to try to make .NET Core work on <laughs> Server 2012. Oh uh, right, right, right. So right. 
build tools, these things are gone. But as far as runtimes, I think we should try to support anything that's still inside Microsoft support land. Yeah. Okay. I think that's kind of story. There's two versions that we support. And that's if you're using our stuff. You can always build an MSI on a .NET Core supported <laughs> platform for an MS for a version of uh, Windows that is well out of support, such as XP. You might just not be able to use our custom actions and things. You will not be able to use our custom actions and so on and so forth. Burn things like that because we're not writing the code to do that. But you could if you were a user. So you can still build MSIs for all that. Um, just can't use our custom actions. And by the way, you can use our .NET Framework build tools on Server 2008, theoretically. Oh, it's .NET Framework is .NET Framework for, for how high? 4.8? Did they go to 4.8? It should be. It, they, yeah. I mean, it was fully supported until yeah. last right. a couple of weeks ago. Right. Okay. Then, then you're right. Then the .NET tool, then it will work there. <laughs> on the .NET Framework, which is where most of the people will be, presumably. Well, I guess that's one of the things we're going to find out. Um, OK, fine. So is this, so we do have some action items here. Yeah, we need to get the different columns right, although they may not be. The build tools are dependent on the .NET Framework or .NET Core, depending on which platform you, you're picking, uh, which stack you're picking to build on. Um, if you're well, on also, the stack includes how you're building using Wix, right? The the Wix. Oh, actually, this is kind of interesting. So, if you're using them as build and you're using framework, Wix tasks, that is all running on framework. Mm -hmm. But if but there's no Wix.exe without .NET Core. Uh, true. Wix.exe is a .NET Core only thing. Correct. So command line can only be, if you're doing a command line, you have to adopt a new world. Yep, a newer world. Unless you run the Wix.exe that's in the build tools, that's in the yeah. tasks. Yeah, unless you go build it, get it. I mean, I don't, but yeah. I, I'm really not worried about build tools. I mean, I'm just, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that worried about the build tools. Besides, most people are going to use MS Build. So it's if you're on .NET Framework, you're just using MS Build. That's what we've always done. It'll be fine. So at the build tools, MS Build support goes back to .NET 4.6. Is that where we're at? I forgot what our minimum bar is there. Um, what if we're targeting there? Two? Yeah, 4.62, right. 4.61, 4.62, whatever that number is. .NET we're Core is 4.6.1, but 4.6.1 is no longer supported. Oh, okay, well then maybe it's 4.6.2. Um, and then um, .NET Core stack, that's for the build tools, depending on which .NET framework you pick, or .NET you pick. I, oh, the names. Um, <laughs> depending on what .NET stack you pick, that obviously sets your minimum bar there. And then the, the, the runtime tools we will do our best to support all the way through. We will not block, certainly, on any supported OS, which includes Server 2008, and then we will you know, go up from there. Gosh, this is supposed to be easy. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> OK. Anyone volunteering for the, for the work? I mean, uh, I can write it all down in the end. Um, we have to figure out. Still haven't finished enough of the doc to know where to put it, um, but yeah. I don't know, where do we put it? I think that's the next big thing, is figuring out where to put it. What page? Because I don't know that we ever wrote it down, did we? It, this doesn't feel like mm -hmm. something we really did a good job writing down in the past. Probably not. So Probably because we supported things that nobody really cared about anymore. I take that back. Server 2003? Yeah, but do we have people complain about that? I don't remember. Um, I don't think we did. I think that was, I mean, that was more have, your goal. Yeah, well, you, we have probably... wanted the, the build machine support. Exactly, but that that has changed in this day and age. So Hugely. 
Yeah, so it's just that's not the same thing. That's that's why I'm not worried about Server 2008, even if it it you know we accidentally broke it. In you know any kind of CI/CD system, you're you're not yeah. running. I'm not worried about it on build side. I'm worried about someone building something using burn, targeting that for their customers yeah, yeah, yeah. that are still running this mission critical thing. Da da da. da that's you know ancient because right. they don't want to move it. Um, so on and so forth. That's just that scenario. Um, I mean. I don't. This isn't doesn't have to be a preview. This has to be in Wix four. We don't have to have this in preview zero. I mean, we're it's all going to be .NET core to start with. So we'll go from there. Let's put it in Wix four, and then I'll let Bob pick who he assigns it to. <laughs> so you guys can sort that out. Well, um, see, this is why I keep my my big twenty sided die for just an occasion. No, oh, right. we have twenty people to assign things to. That sounds great. Um, no, no, you get ranges. Oh. I, hope I, I get, a, get assigned. If, if I was gonna say, do I just get like twenty? I'll just be, I'll just be nope. critical hit. <laughs> I'm, I'm one. <laughs> critical miss. You and Sean split the other nineteen. Oh, how do you do? How do you do that? Okay. Um, what's the question here, Sean? Uh, provide a way to enable logging. Is this just? Oh, this is a feature request. Tracking the work. Yeah. And I'm the per not user. Not planning on doing it anytime soon, so I don't know if someone else is gonna do it. Um, this is just for logging. Let's put it in V4 just so that at, with a comment that we just need to re-review this as we get a better feel on how the plan dump stuff works out in the log file. Um, we'll feedback, hopefully, or evaluation as we go through preview zero. So we'll come back to it in V4, and then if still nobody wants to do it, we can punt it out of there. Remove cache ID. You will never believe this, but I just had a customer I talked to the other day that was using cache ID. to share cabinets across MSIs. And I was like, what are you doing? As soon as I saw it, I was like, what are you doing? And then they described what they were doing, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, and that's something we want to support? I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's a very, it's a insanely advanced feature but when it works it can be very cool but I don't know how I feel about it I will admit I have used this feature in the past yeah it's it's extremely esoteric it's really hard to get right <clears throat> it's hard to, to even know when you need it yeah this um, guy figured, I mean he was using it correctly I mean yeah. He found it. He yeah. was using it exactly correctly. I was like, wow. And he built this huge system to support it. And it was it was impressive, everything he had done. Um, and and had that not happened, I would have been like, yeah, this can just go. But now that I've seen it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is terrifying. This is the kind of thing you <sighs> – I think we've discussed this in the past, how certain things should be difficult enough to to use um, that that maybe they're enabled only by like an extension. So you have to take several steps to use stuff that's you know dangerous. Not really. Well, it could be an option here, but. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. It's like the uh, here, take this uh, test, and we can take the training wheels off before you get access to any of these attributes. Right, right. Because um, you really shouldn't be doing anything here. Ah, uh, I don't know what to do. So we just put in V four and come back. Yeah, I mean we're not gonna do this in preview zero, so. Um, yes. Do you want to leave it open or, or for triage? Like come back next week or come back eventually? No, come back in V4. I don't, we don't need to deal with it preview zero. I mean, it, okay. it's esoteric enough that if we introduce that breaking change, we'll, we'll eat that. <laughs> we'll just deal with it. Um, all right. So this had a interesting conversation that went on it. 
um, that I initially misunderstood based off of what Blair said. I was like, well, what's going on here? But then I realized the guy is asking for something semi-reasonable in that when the head request fails, fall back to Git. This has been a problem to Git. So Burn does a head request to, to figure out the size of the file and to figure out if you can do chunking, which was more interesting back in the early days of Burn because it... Um, it had to support HTTP 1.0, or rather HTTP 1.0 was still a thing, so not every server supported range requests. So it was kind of a way of feeling out if you could do range requests on something, um, on a server. And that's really not a thing. Now the thing that's happening are people turning off some verbs on their HTTP servers, which I kind of, I guess, I don't know, I guess I can understand. Um, so there's always been this thing where burn makes two requests to figure out if you could do a range request and then does the get that it always was like, you know, it'd be nice if Burn could just do start getting, right? Instead of doing two requests. Also, I don't know how important the feature is for resuming anymore, given that I don't know, it's probably showing the Western bias here, but it's like things are fast and pretty stable now. I don't know if we're having a lot of people have interrupted downloads. Um but maybe we don't have them because Burn solves that problem. I don't know. Um, especially with the large file. Is it supported outside of a single apply phase? Yes. Yes. Burn could download a partial file and resume. I think. After a reboot? I think so. Hmm. I could be wrong That's... about that, but I think so. Although I take that, you know, with the security changes we made, we may pick random folders now that prevents that from working um, that may not work anymore. I was going to say it wouldn't obviously wouldn't get cached because it wouldn't pass the hash check. Right. Um, it wouldn't be in the cache. It would be in the working folder. But if we restart and came back with a new working folder, which you probably do, then yeah, that would be a thing. Um, but then I realized... That would, be, that would still have value. Just the, being able to restart within a session is less interesting, though still Kind of yeah, cool. it's it's the hey your internet blipped retry yeah. hey look we didn't start downloading your two gigabyte file from the beginning again we picked up from however right. far we were um, and it works so anyway so there's all this but then I realized like if the HTTP head request fails I think we fall back to Git the problem here is that the head request actually responded 404 and that's right. where I kind of went wait a minute. You explicitly said on a head request that the file does not exist, and now you're complaining that Burn doesn't think the file exists. And then I got less confident that what Burn is doing is wrong, because it does have the fallback in there. What's, what, what's the correct response code if the operation isn't supported? I mean, there's a There's a code that says that. a method not supported. I don't know what it is. Method not supported. Okay. It's something okay. like that. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Um, so then he's arguing that if the head fails for any reason, you should do the git anyway. Which back in the old days, you know, I don't know, some period of time before people started mucking with putting lots of code in front of the HTTP request, um, that wasn't really an issue. But now with people mucking with them, maybe it is a thing. Or maybe now that we're talking about HTTP 1.3 as optional and HTTP 1.2 is kind of, or is that, no, HTTP 2, sorry. HTTP 1.1 is pretty much everywhere now. Maybe we should just stop doing the head requests and just start doing the ranged GET requests from the beginning. Because it would also save us the extra right. head call. HTTP 1.0 fails reliably with the range request? Uh, well, if the server only supports HP 1.0, range requests didn't exist when they were implemented. Like range requests were an HP 1.1 feature. Sorry, I guess I'm asking, right, I'm asking if we can fall back. If if we're talking to a 1.0 server, can we fall back and not do a range request? Or will the 1.0 server ignore the range request and always serve the whole file? I think it ends up starting to serve the whole file because it doesn't recognize it. And the head request avoids that's, that problem by only right, headers. Right. 
I, I'd say as long as we handle that case, then yeah, we could skip the head request. All right, let's put this in 4.0. I'm going to go back and f on the idea of getting rid of the head request completely. Just because, you know, in the day of many downloads and stuff, maybe fewer requests, in the, not, in the world of many updates, fewer requests may be a thing because you can cut the request for payloads in half by not making all these head requests. Um, and when you say you're curious about this, yes, I am. I am. I'll, I'll take it. If it doesn't fit in four, it, if it, you know, very good. Let's see this. There's a low likelihood I'll get it in four, but I don't want to punt it quite yet. Sure. Um, I also don't remember how hard it is. I'm, I'm afraid because caching isn't simple already. It got really right. twisted by not being designed up front um, for all the problems that it was going to face later. And so it kind of got, things got tacked on and tacked on and tacked on. And so that code is not easy, not an easy place to start. It may require unraveling to do this. Yeah, which then may be at a point that I just don't feel like um, tackling that problem. Um, uh, Sean, when do you think I can remove these GitHub requests? I removed the one that said you can remove this one, but then it said, please do not delete this one. So I left it. Well, the, the problem is, is that when regular people are creating an issue, it actually is not getting auto-labeled. <sighs> so we have a, I have a support request open for that. You want to leave this open then for a little bit? So longer? yeah, just leave okay. it open for now. Will do. Document all public types of members. Bob, you're No, you're we did not do this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, all public types of members, yep, and go through and make sure that, I mean, really what this is going to get us is also make sure that, uh, that we don't have anything public that shouldn't be public. Right, um, right. Yeah, this is mostly about, about documenting the interfaces, I think. Yep. We have a, a, a smaller handful of, of classes that get exposed, but. Right, and Sean it, wants to talk about those the, too. So, yes. Um, I guess one interesting thing is like all of the symbols are public, but none of them have documentation, but I have a feeling that that's not going to be something we're interested in doing. That is not a small weekend project. No. Uh, no, that's just uh, here. Let's take a couple. But they pretty much, they have to be public though. Oh yeah. They have to be public. Um, Which it would be great if they were all documented, but I mean, that's just a, Tremendous amount of effort for rapidly reducing value over time. Um, yep. Uh, yeah, definitely. All right. So I think document all public types of members, and we'll put a caveat in here. Um, data will be the last thing. Data could turn into a multi-year project when you know when someone's bored, <clears throat> they could go and type some documentation into it. Yes, um, because that's what writing is: typing. Yeah. Well, most of I, if we get a start, most of them will follow a pattern. I mean, yeah. Anyway, the problem is the symbols are you know highly reflective of of MSI. MSI. You have to know MSI. There's no doubt about that. Well, and well, and we have this this we've always had this problem for you know going on 17 years that when stuff is that similar. It's like, at what point are you documenting the thing that's underlying? It's it's a problem. Yeah, well, at this point, people don't know the difference between Wix and Windows Installer most of the time, or know that Windows Installer exists at all, and they blame us for everything. So Yeah, that's fair. And I just it's just like, at some point, maybe we just absorb the Windows Installer documentation and go, there, we are the Windows Installer, because for all intents and purposes, we're the only one updating anything around it, a lot of custom actions. Um, so... Anyway, I, I think this is a good thing. We should put it in 4.0, and then it's a it's a never-ending task. It's a it's a never exactly exactly. All right, ah, this one backend shouldn't reference Wix toolset core. I don't know that I agree with that. I don't know that I agree with that. Hmm. 
back end. Well, today the back ends are in core. The the right. And if it's you want to your Yeah. In the repo. They're not you're in talking about core. Right. And to and to write one you have to reference the core assembly itself. Sure. Yeah, and the the thing is that I don't extensibility in my mind when I started it was really about extensions, um, and putting all the interfaces there you'd need to write any given extension. Backends have a different relationship with the Wix tool set, um, a larger relationship I think, um, a more intimate one. Yeah, there you go, and. So I don't know Valentine's that Day is coming up. Ah, thanks. I don't know that mm -hmm. we should move things for backends into extensibility if it confuses extensions. Well, then maybe we need a or core extensibility. We could. We could certainly do that. We could also have namespaces in the extensibility assembly to make it clear if you're building different things, which ones you should be using. Um, yeah. If we want extensibility to be the, the one place for all these interfaces. Um, I mean, this is kind of why I was wanting to move all those interfaces in core elsewhere as well like you should yeah. be able to but there's three different, there's things. three different extensibility mechanisms one is an extension as we know it people reference them they are um so, so we have those then we have the the next level of extensibility is that you could write a custom back end um which is a huge amount of work and you have to deeply understand the whole system and, and also then, is exposed as an extension. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. See, it's there's, all, there'd it's be no other way of, of of inserting it into the right into the system. Well, yeah, you're right. They they have ended up becoming the same thing as we've kind of morphed around trying to get that loading right to be able to have the back end. Yeah, they have morphed into extensions. Although so it, it, that, it is worth pointing out that that you know at the moment at least I don't know of of any backend that doesn't have um, th that isn't built in. Correct. We don't have any that aren't built in right now. Um, FireGiant does, but um, well, FireGiant has something that acts like a backend, but we haven't moved it to Wix four yet. Um, so that's, that's kind of, it's a future problem that we haven't tackled yet. So I just haven't sat down and tried to make this work, but you're right. The fact that, it, that backends are now extensions means that maybe this needs just a little bit of scrubbing because the third, sorry. So I'm aware of it. we have extensions, we have backends, and then we have the third thing is hosting where you can actually create your own host of the Wix tool set, as opposed to Wix.exe and the MS build task that we provide as the standard thing that almost everybody does, um, you can also host the core tool set yourself. And pulling those extensions out into extensibility, is that's what I'm, I'm even less certain about than the backend ones, because that's not even an extensibility point, that's a hosting point. So you're like, this core, I'm going to host you, here's the interfaces that I can get out of it. Um, they're not inter they're not extensibility interfaces. It's not like uh, here's the extensibility for comp i compiler. You're like no no no. <laughs> the core tool set provides an i compiler. It's not an not an extensibility as a place to go get it. Now we could pull out and say here's an interface assembly f that you need for hosting that you should build to host the core tool set. But then we get into you know how strong a uh, contract do we want to have on that hosting um, behavior? And right now, it's, uh, we're a, it's a little loosey-goosey that because you take a direct reference to core, then when you take a new reference to core, do we maintain bind matter? <laughs> do we need, do we choose to maintain perfect backwards compatibility on that? 
And given the hosting of the Wix tool set, outside of all these other tools, is still pretty new, I wasn't quite sure that we were going to get as stable as we should with the extensions, where we have a bunch of them and we've been doing them for a while, so on and so forth. And I'm certainly less confident in backends as well which is why I haven't promoted them to the extensibility namespace where we're like, hey, yeah, this is an extensibility thing. This is what you can you can build on. So that's that's kind of the thinking and why some of these things haven't moved to their clean spaces. But they've also been, a lot of these things have been shifting around as we've tried to sort out various little niggling problems deep in the implementation of the core and its relationship with the backends and getting data back and forth and appropriately and inserting the uh, extensions into the pipeline amongst them all and all that kind of stuff. So I can see a strong argument for moving the back end, these guys for back ends to be moved to uh, extensibility. The hosting of the core, I'm not sure we should move that yet. I'm curious about the commands. Well, we don't really have interfaces like that today. Well, I mean, no, there should be like a, a new service that you call a method on it and it does the command behind the scenes. You wouldn't expose it directly. Oh, oh, so like a back, uh, well, we already have one, a back end helper kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's not clean yet either the way the commands are being loaded and stuff like that that's just not i don't feel like that's fully factored in getting all of the problems right yet to be truly nice clean hosting and i don't know that we're going to get it clean in four i don't i'm not I'm not confident we're going to choose to take the slips in four to like refactor everything to make hosting perfectly great um I think part of it, well, part of it is we've we've done this, you know, kind of large refactoring of of the internals of Wix, yeah, extensibility and hosting, yep, and you know, it, it's it's a big one, and yeah, that probably means we're yeah you know, we didn't get everything exactly right. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just there's only so much you can hold in the head, right? Like, the, and the pipeline introduced a whole lot more extensibility points again. Those, yeah, it is. Like, it's just there's it's not all perfect yet. Um, and although looking at like I backend helper, it already, ha I mean, it, it's a, it's a miscellaneous toolbox. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I can see, I can see us, you know, extending that with, with uh, some of these things. Yeah. I'm also, you know, like for hosting, um, certainly for hosting. And I'm also going to say certainly for backends, that it does assume a familiarity with the internals of Wix that you know, it kind of goes beyond I think what we what we have today for um, for quote unquote normal extensions. Yeah, I mean the, it's the tag extension and the dependent extension are borderline the most complicated extensions or d deepest integrated. Right, but otherwise most of the extensions are, hey, I transform this XML into this blob of data. Um, or the, the, honestly, at this point, I transform this XML into these set of symbols and I put them back in the MSI and then I add the custom action. Yay, go. Yep. And yep. it's just that over and over and over. And we probably at some point should make that really, really, really easy to do because it's yeah. still probably more steps than it should be. Um, but, um, so I yeah. For this issue, I like. I really think we do need a new assembly with all the interfaces in core. And then whether or not that is like stable when we release four or not doesn't really matter. But it... <laughs> sorry about that. I remember what I talked about school interrupting. There we go. Yep. Um, sorry. Although, how you cool said, is it that, that, you know, little kids need to worry about teams? Teams? Meet? Yeah, right. Oh, like I've, I've said, they have more meetings than I do um, in this day and age. Um, of course, they're all like 30-minute meetings. Um, 
and actually help to their agenda. Ah, teachers are good like that. Um, sorry, you're saying we need another assembly for all, all the interfaces in core. So I that I don't, I, I understand what you're saying and I know why you want to do that. And I'm not sure I want to do that yet for core, right? That that's a, it's on the step towards, Hey, yeah, here's a set of interfaces. These won't break from versions of core. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, and it's, I'm not, I'm just, promise. right. I'm just not there yet. But there's a difference between saying these won't break and saying you can write your code in a testable way. So it, if we way. say that you should be able to build a backend against these interfaces and nothing else, you shouldn't have to reference core. That means that everything that needs to be exposed to a backend is accessible through an interface and not a class. Okay. So I, I, I get for backends, but for hosting the core, Well, again, you want the interface so you can mock out the core so you could test your host. Yeah, because your your host is not going to be just. It's not going to be simple, right? You're going to be doing some interesting things where you might want to mock it out. Yeah, I. Well, for the most part. I mean, because I've I've written code that hosts. Wix. And for the most part, the, those interfaces are all there. They're just part of core. And I, I, I appreciate the, the idea that putting them in a separate assembly or at least a separate namespace would you know, make it easier to make sure that we don't mess up that separation. But like, you know, today, you, if you want to host, if you want to do something, something like Wix.exe, the interfaces for you know for all the different phases you know compilation decompilation binding resolution they're all there they're just part of you know their interfaces exposed through core directly so i i the separation is fine and i think you know one advantage of separating them out is that we can explicitly say that you know these are not you know semver qualified we don't we don't promise them for compatibility because again these are you know you're integrating deeply and so if we have pain you should have some too <laughs> so there's one advantage to separating them out but i think you know architecturally i think you know again knowing that we're not perfect um i think you know the the core does expose the core does the right thing. It's just not, you know, physically separated. Yeah. You can do what you want without it just means that your testing is still gonna have the the core assembly as opposed to a smaller um, interface assembly. And mocking out is still gonna be the same thing. You can mock it out the same way. Now that said I'd also like to look at any any of the classes that should not be public yeah and and maybe this is i mean this probably goes with the sweep maybe we're going to go through and say yeah you know what let's collect all these public things and push them into a separate assembly to make it really clear the things that are public and then make everything else internal except what the wix tool set service provider i guess is the only thing that would end up being public or out of core no big gigantic god object everybody hates um, but or, sorry not everybody hates it works for what we're doing because <laughs> it yes. matches the which are singletons and which are not and it does the right thing so like... I'm not I'm not sold on this yet backends given that they're already such Give me this preview. Oh, I'm not gonna get this preview zero. I mean, yeah, look, oh, no, it, it doesn't have to be preview. Zero. No, it doesn't have no. to. It's, give me a bit with four. There is more here to clean up around the backends, and honestly, I'm gonna get into it when I get into the extensions that extend the backend. That's gonna hit these problems again, or it's gonna expose another facet of the problems. So it's a matter of having a chance to look at the whole thing holistically and decide how things should get rejiggered 
and exposed um, appropriately. Oh, Jacob was, wait, when does Jacob's have, did I miss these comments from Jacob? Oh, that's all about the head stuff. There are a couple minutes before 10. That's really weird. Okay, then it was, wow. Sorry, Jacob, I know you're at another meeting. Sorry, we weren't ignoring you, but we were kind of ignoring you, I guess. Um, did I have that covered? I don't know, how did I miss that? Um, so, Give us to me and I will do the design. I, I need to do a design review on these things. And uh, see, I've been trying to get rid of file facade forever um, and failing miserably, particularly in patching brought it back in a big way. Um, resolve delayed fields and extract embedded files. Command. These two go together and they're helper methods that probably should be on like the backend helper or something. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So this for the back ends definitely needs to be thought. And whether it goes into extensibility or another assembly, we can think about that. I'd be fine if it comes out of core. Yeah, where it put yeah, exactly. It's just does it go into a core sensibility or I don't know what to call it. Um you know, what do we call it? Core interfaces. Um but yeah, we'll we'll come back to that. The decision has to be made. All right, I think we made it through all of them then. Woohoo! It's ten thirty. All right. <laughs> so let's move on to the thing Sean wanted to cover today, which is this very nice um, large change. You know, you you know you're in for fun when GitHub doesn't show the diff. Yeah. Um, how do you want to tackle this, Sean? Um, I guess just go commit by commit. All right. So at a high level, what are we doing here? Um, are these in the order of the commits? Yeah. Okay. So remove feature to uninstall compatible orphaned MSI packages. Yeah, I have no idea where that came from. Um, I oh, think 3.7 feature. What's that? The the compatible packages were a three seven feature, right? No. No. Uh, okay. No, I think that it was for Visual Studio. They're creating yeah, it was patch so okay. Visuals, yeah, I think what they were trying to do was trying to clean up after a bundle that didn't clean up after itself somehow. And they just gave these ginormous changes, and you're like, take it or leave it. And you're like, what do we do here? Move registry checks for dependency ref counting into detect. Um, is there anything? I, I'm fine with this if there isn't anything that we have to recalculate. Oh, that's going to come up later, uh, where you have to recalculate the plan. But now you're going to say to do a plan, you have to recall detect. Yeah. If you apply it, you yeah. can do multiple plans. Sure, sure, sure. But if you apply it, then you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Yes. Okay. That was probably true before, really. Um, yeah, you really should have detected before again, as yes. well. Yeah. Clean up synchronization between the engine and the BA. Um, I don't know what synchronization there was. Activate engine, deactivate engine. It was, it, yeah, it was the activate engine. So, like, when you called, like, set source, when you're changing the source of a payload. Ah, uh, so when the BA was making a call into the engine. It was making sure the engine wasn't activated. It wasn't right. performing because an operation. Because it was worried about the changing stuff while, yeah, while it was operating on them. Right. Okay. So that code wasn't, it was probably working, but it was a lot more complicated than it should have been. Yeah, well, it started with a whole bunch of mutex stuff in it that in the end I think we didn't need, and so I probably never got refactored back to a, here's what you really needed now that you have the whole view of the world. So, okay, that makes sense to me. Set update verifies the engine isn't activated. Probably a good thing. Um, uh, the callbacks deactivate the engine, okay. 
um, activating the engine and handling VA requests to change the engine. Now use the same critical section. Okay. Yeah, who I don't know why those would have been different. They were probably, yeah, yeah. Elevate and quit, now activate the engine. Probably a good thing. And the BA received, any BA requests received after the quit are ignored. Okay. Ignored as in, like, they just, they don't go anywhere or they fail? Ignored. Um, okay. So these are like apply or plan or detect. Yeah. So they were already, there's already this separation of posting the message. So the BA gets success because the message was posted. But uh, then on the, on the back end, when it processes right. the request, right. it's just it's asynchronous. Right. It's asynchronous. So you're going to post it. It's going to say, hey, you posted this. And, then, and if the message comes in after quit, then it's like presumably what happens to a Windows message pump after you get the post quit message. Nothing else gets processed and your queue gets dumped. OK, plan. Re -re Require redetect after apply. Right. Plan requires successful detect. Plan requires redetect after apply has been called. Right. Apply requires successful plan. Apply won't rerun a plan. Did do we have a scenario where apply would rerun the plan? Uh, so the Wix BA uses the retry like that. <laughs> if you hit that retry button, it'll just go apply again, or it'll it'll plan. I think maybe. I think it would redo the plan. The Wix BA would call plan if you hit retry. But yeah, it would try to apply a plan that already was applied. Uh, the, this is the BAL retry stuff? Yeah. Yeah, see, that's trying to continue an MSI. See, it doesn't want a new, it shouldn't want a new plan. It should just want to try to apply the application again. Well, I'm talking about apply failed, yeah. and then the WixBA allowed the user to retry, if you remember. Is this the BAL retry? I, 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 I know the feature for the BAL retry. I just don't remember how it re oh, no, the install. It, that's not. Oh, OK. I don't remember us having a button in the in the Wix BA that said this on on the failed screen. It had a no. It couldn't be on the failed screen. It yeah, had to be on the retry log. Really? Maybe I misread yeah, it. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I didn't know that it did anything other than just you know redetect, replan, and reapply. Yeah. So just so I'm worried, like so I'm worried, like if there. There are these set of transient MSI failures where the correct answer is to rerun the MSI package. And if that's going to, if we can't do that anymore and we have to go back to redetect, I'm worried about that then running back to like, hey, let me go see if there's an update and no, that's blowing different. the whole thing up again. Retrying a package during apply is not what we're talking about here. Yeah, right. That, that should be retrying a package during apply. Yeah, okay. That, I hope that's using that. It's got to be using that feature. It wouldn't be going, yeah, it's got to be using that feature. Okay, then then this should be fine. Like, that was the only one I was worried about. This should all be fine, right? Update the logic for determining when the bundle should be registered. Yep. Automatically uninstall the bundle after quit if eligible. Yeah, exciting. And change the implementation of cache always to request the cache state. So this allows the BA to override the always cache. Was this a bug? Someone asked for this? Or, no, this this is oh no. This makes it possible for the prereq BA to not cache packages while installing the prereq. So it only caches its packages and nothing else. Oh, so it can say, hey, I only need .NET Framework, for example. So I want you to cache that. Oh. And anything else that says always that the MS, that the user may have said, hey, I always want this MSI cached. You can say, no, 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 no. I, I yeah, you worry about that later. <laughs> I only need .NET Framework for what I'm doing right now, right? It'd be funny because if you didn't do this, then the same problem with, you know, oh, there's an ERP entry would still apply. Yes, because your yeah. MSI package would still be cached. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense to me. So, no, it was not a separate bug, but I realized that it needs to be fixed as part of this. As part of six. 
and five, five, yeah, right. It's follow-ons from all those. Okay. I don't know how to tackle this. Um, <laughs> well, like this one should uh, just be deleting. Yeah, this, I don't think we're everything. Interesting. It's like, here's a whole bunch of message system stuff. Isn't it? Isn't it great to get rid of old stuff? Get rid of more. Yeah. Oh wow, there's even a message in here. This relied heavily on detect or dependency stuff, huh? Yes. So if it detected a MSIs were present in a not installed wow. So if you had an MSI package in your bundle with a certain provider if a newer version of a package was registered under that provider, then it was registered, like it was installed, but it didn't have any dependence in the dependency registry. Then it considered it an orphaned MSI package and it would uninstall it as part of this bundle. Well, probably what they were thinking was, well, if there's a package with no dependence, then it can be cleaned up and un uninstalled. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out what scenario would have got them into this. Oh, I don't, <laughs> I can't guess about that one. They well, probably... the dependency stuff is easy to get wrong. I'm wondering if this is just yeah, clean up after if someone got something wrong. Someone got something wrong. So yeah, yeah, my my guess would be they changed burn to where it didn't uninstall it when it should have. So then they made the different bundle do it if it's smart enough. Uh, yeah, that would be this, this is a oh, this is a way to, you know this is a way to get get out of the uh, the manifest security yeah yeah which was something that was desired at one point yeah but they never solved all the security problems that came from it so no but they're like we want this but then yeah okay why was that null before huh. it was passing in the parent the so if oh I see Oh. So when it when it calls process package oh, on it on had the to package, add a compatible package. So oh. it was passing in the MSI package that was part of the bundle, so it could copy all the information. Right. Oh gosh. It's crazy. I'm afraid of the scenario here, but like I two conflicting things that work here. One, they're a large scale system. They may have exposed a problem that needs to be handled. Two, they had a tendency, like Bob said, to just do the thing that took them forward without really thinking about all the implications. And so I, like, I, so they have problems that need to be solved, but I don't always trust the implementation that they chose to do it. And when these things were coming in, they were completely, completely untethered, so they just go off and write a whole bunch of stuff and burn and then drop it on us nine months later and say, here, here's the fixes that we've, changes we've made over the last time period. It's very challenging conversations that are very frustrating. So I'm, I'm worried that we're missing something here that this was solving, but I don't know what it is, so I'm stuck. I guess we'll find out. At least it's not in a nice little one change that we can always try to find and bring back if we go, oh, that's what that was doing. Well, a big reason why I was removing it is because that's another thing that's happening during plan where it should have been happening during detect. Yes. See, 
Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's a that's a very normal behavior. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, right? Is the not understanding the global system and not talking to us about how to design the global system and just implementing something small. Kind of like so the if, conversation you're having about the .NET Core detection. Like, I don't know where that's at. I know you guys have been having threads on it. And it's like, well, we'll just do this narrow thing. You're like, well, how do you solve the bigger problem? And there's just that difference of understanding. So thing. I guess what I'm trying to say is we would not bring this back. We'd have to- Certainly not this it. way, right? It would be need to be implemented as a detect feature, not as a plan feature. All right, uh, dependency initialize. What are, where are we? This is Corn. should just be refactoring to where I'm looking we're for the delete. <laughs> yeah, we're storing the dependents during detect, and then we're processing those during plan. Okay. So you're I, looking for deletes. Well, dependency initialize. Dependency detect. So I, I I've there, moved. Yeah, yeah it's it's moving a, they're, they're moving. I'm looking for the delete line that said they moved from somewhere else. Um, well, mm, I, it would have been moved from here. Dependency plan initialize is where yes. it came from. Right. That's what I'm looking for. All right. I don't know how to think about these things right now. Fancy initialize. So it was providing these before, and now you're just saying go and detect them. Or no, this is not that function. <sighs> no parent. I haven't been to the dependency stuff in a long time. <sighs> On ourselves, yeah. Is this just refactoring of things that were there before? Yeah, I shouldn't have changed anything. Yeah, it's just the diffs aren't lining up. Sean, you added a message. It looks like So originally, the dependency would tell you about all the dependents for a package. Mm -hmm. Like if it's if it skipped a package, it would say, give you all the dependents. But for the bundle itself, it didn't tell you what the dependents were. It was just a count. It was just a count. Okay. So okay. So that new message repeats for each one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, honestly, this commit is not going to be easy to look at. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to find anything in it. But honestly, I'm not going to. Even if I did, I have to pour over it and reload tremendous amounts of context to really provide anything useful in here. I thought I was trying to see if I could pick it up as I was going along. But this is all dependency.cvp, which is not a thing that I was in much anyway. I mean, the... I guess the most interesting thing was when I figured out that the bundle provider key didn't actually mean the bundle provider key. So when it was doing, when it was trying <coughs> to figure out whether the bundle itself was registered, like it was creating that list of dependencies to ignore. And the code said it was adding the provider key, bundle provider key. But when you traced it all the way back up, it was actually the bundle ID and not the bundle provider key. It's I made it still work as it did before. So it's using the bundle ID instead of the bundle provider key. But that's something that. What does the bundle provider key do then? Where is it used? It It might be used in other places like it might be that the bundle provider key is only supposed to be used 
when creating the bundle provider in the registry. But when it's checking dependence on packages, it might it might be that it's not actually supposed to look at the bundle provider key. It really is only supposed to be looking at the bundle ID when looking at all the dependence of all the packages. Oh, I wonder if they did something that allows you to have multiple bundles contribute to one provider. Well, the, I'm pretty sure I traced this back to you. <laughs> Bum, bum, bum. The the switching like there was a commit I found where it there was refactoring done like it was implementing bundle ref counting and there's a whole block of changes and part of that was passing in the bundle ID instead of the bundle provider key into what gets ignored when looking at package dependence when figuring out whether it should be ignored or not. This is a long time ago then. And it could have just been me porting the code from inside to outside because that's what I did a lot back then too. Because mm -hmm. I'll source depot to public. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at all that. This stuff is not the easy things. It's reference tracking. It's just never simple. I don't know if I'm going to see anything in here. But the idea makes sense to me. Ref counting to detect. Yes, that's absolutely true. All this should have been in detect. All right. Clean up synchronization. Uh, no, oh, I see, got it. It was passing in. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, no, no. You're like, uh, do you really need those somewhere? No. All right, so you are no longer deactivating, activating, deactivating engine. This, am I going to see this? So it's, that got moved into user experience. So if the, in that code before, uh, in three, it would have called directly into the comm interface. But today... Uh, you yeah. call through user experience for all the callbacks. Yep. So in user experience, you'll see it deactivate the engine before actually calling the BA. Can you do that? It should only be deactivated during the callback. Yeah, so, so you're narrowing the scope of the callback or the of the activation or the deactivation. Yeah, deactivation. But launch proof XE. So I moved the activation up to the message pump. So it'll activate the engine yeah, before that. doing any of those operations. Yes, yeah, so this is just redundant. You said you had another one that you could use. Uh, here. So that's where the message pump is activating before processing the message. Oh, and then you do the opposite on the callbacks. Right. I wonder why we had to. That's kind of weird. Yeah, they're just done at different times. So this is really like the most interesting part of it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> like I. I don't understand all the complexities that was going on here. I 
I mean, I guess it was, you didn't have, you weren't processing the BA requests as like a Windows message at some point in time so that it was actually possible to hit core detect multiple times, like at the same time. Because with the message pump, I, I couldn't figure out how that could have possibly been happen. Are you there? Yeah, no, I'm thinking, I, I'm trying to think of a scenario where it could have. Well, when it was happening all, this was also testing before, right? So you couldn't take the critical section because you didn't want a deadlock um, if it was called back on any of the message, the UX callbacks. That was probably at one point the concern, right? So you had to do this test. Oh, look. If we try to take this critical section, we're going to deadlock ourselves. So don't do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, test this boolean, and then return. Hey, we we you know we are um, in an invalid state. So you try to, to do this, and it would prevent the deadlocks. That was the idea. that was what this was doing before. But if it can't happen because you enter at the beginning of the message pump now, see by doing that, that simplifies it a lot. Um, if you can just say here, I've entered because I've done a message that it's going to lock the engine, detect plan update. Yeah, see, it wasn't that clean before uh, in the very, very, very beginning. So it could have just been something that never was refactored wholly. And now that you can see the whole system, you can be like, hey, you can make this a lot simpler. And could have made it a lot simpler before, I just didn't realize it. Now, is this just all these messages being sent from an inactive engine? Right. Yeah. Deactivate, send it, activate. Right. So I wasn't doing that to narrow the scope. I mean, the point of doing this here was just to centralize it. Cen sorry, that, that's you're right. Not narrow, centralize. Sorry. What, your word is better than mine. Right. You centralized it as opposed to narrowing it, where before it was spread all over the place. And by being spread all over the place, I don't think it was recognized that it couldn't happen. Unless, yeah, with the message pump, how would you do that? I, could you get into it with, if someone said detect and then plan? No, because the detect message had to finish before the plan message would be allowed through. So you, they couldn't call detect and plan and get stuck, right? Right. Right. Yeah, so the message pump probably solved that when we finally got there. Although th there, that is two different things. The the message pump handling, like apply, plan, whatever, is different from deactivating the engine so that the BA can like change the source of things. No, I, I understand. Yeah, understood. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, those, those are different. Is but it was the centralization of the the law of the activation of the engine, that that helps a lot. Yeah, OK. Makes sense to me. And if it's not deadlocking, then that's great. <laughs> Require redetect. All right, this is just resetting the states. Detect reset, plan reset. Why do we have these states out? All right, well, I don't care. That's that comment. Why are these booleans set outside as opposed to, I don't know, okay. Well, they're on the engine state. They're not on the registration. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. Uh, succeeded. Detected is true. Yeah, okay, fine. Continue planning. I moved that up. Oh, from down here somewhere? Yeah. yeah. So this was kind of an incidental change. So before, 
if you got into that state where the bundle would refuse to run because you asked it to uninstall when it has dependents, it would still print out all the planned packages, even though it wasn't going to do anything. <laughs> so it, it was kind of confusing to see. Yeah, yeah that's good stuff there. That's good. Um, random note. You can do exit on root failure when you are the root, when you are causing the failure. That way you can set the debugging down the very bottom. Like this probably, sh well, maybe that, uh, I don't know that this should be root failure because the failure actually happens inside there in contrast. All right, root failure is kind of like, you can think of it as like the, the initial throw. That's where it's supposed to be used. And it's, and it's hidden behind things like exit on Win32 failure. Um, and the one time that you need to manually set it is when you are setting the error code on something at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's the intent of it. And maybe we should have a thing that's like, you know, exit with failure. Do we? We might have an exit with, I don't remember if we do. Anyway, you could have HR comma, the thing you want to fail with, and then it collects a root failure. But I, whatever. Anyway, that's the intent of exit on root failure. Because there's a special function that does nothing that's not optimized the way that you can set a breakpoint in, like dutil root failure, dutil underscore root failure, something like that. I always have to look it up, but it's been a long time. If you set a breakpoint on that, you run burn, then you can get down to the immediately to the thing that caused the um, the root failure. All right. Let's see. Planning. Yeah. Okay. This is your making the login better. And check the plan if it's applied, and then the quit, and then the flow, and then the quit message. Oh, ignore operation after. Okay, so this is the ignoring after quit. Okay. So this is kind of a weird scenario to actually hit. Like, your VA would have to call, or maybe it's not even possible. You'd have to call the quit and then get another message in there before the quit message actually got into the queue. Couldn't you call quit and then call quit? Oh, no. I guess I, it depends on who's calling process message. Yeah. Actually, that might be unreachable now that I think about it. <laughs> All right, update logic for determining when the bundle should be re-registered. I assume where this one's going to be bigger. Yeah, this is going to be <laughs> hard. I'm going to skip the apply for now. Yeah. I don't know that I'm going to find anything looking through this one. This one's, yeah, let's see. Does not surprise me. So yeah, it's tracking the cache state and the install state separately from everything else. And it's just doing record keeping on whether it's present or ignored if there's dependency stuff going on. This needed to be done this way. You had to go back all the way to the beginning and kind of work your way back to the beginning. I think I'll wait my hands around. Um, XE update install registration status. Do we have one of these for everybody? Yeah. The patch is the different one. Mm hmm. I see. I see. Each package says that they can participate in that. If they're greater than cache, then present, otherwise you're absent. Yep. And another interesting thing about the... Greater than cache? 
for install state. Okay. The other interesting thing about this install registration state is whether to ignore the failure. <laughs> That's kind of that other bug that we have need to talk about, but with the rollback boundaries and such. Yeah, trying trying to decide whether to trust the exit code. Yeah. When figuring out whether the install worked yeah. or not. Yeah. Because that rollback boundary could override and say, yeah, I don't really care about that failure. Yeah. But what I was find what I found out was that that exit code is the real exit code that we're getting. So if you cancel an MSI package too late, then you will get a zero error success from the MSI in that method, even though later the burn will change the exit code to cancel that you'll see in the log. So in that scenario that we're talking about, it's burn that's changing it to cancel. It, it's not MSI exec that gave us back, well not MSI exec, but it's not Windows installer that gave us mm -hmm. cancel. That makes sense to me. This is once you've gotten to the point in Don't the try. MSI that it can't, yeah. it won't cancel. Yeah. Right. We hold on to it and then we force it. Which means rolling back that MSI you just installed, maybe. All right, I get the pattern out here. Yep, at a package level. This is kind of interesting anyway. I mean, this information is interesting. Uh, plan, I suppose. And so then all this keeps... Whoa, so the registration command is gone? Or... Yeah. It's purely calculated. Right. Uh, but it's not calculated at. Oh, you have to calculate it. You have to at recalculate the end. it. Yeah, yeah. Da. I had a feeling this was going to be nasty. I didn't think it was going to be this bad, but this was a lot more work than I expected. Oh, was it? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I thought I said that this is not going to be easy. I didn't think it was going to be easy. I didn't think it was going to take this much work either. Mm -hmm. This is not surprising to me. I guess I'd say that. So, I guess somewhere in between is it's all good. Calculate. Keep registration. Why must be such a pain? Um, it's slipstreaming too, isn't it? Yeah. It's part of the challenge. Because they disappear, right, when they're slipstreaming. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Nothing surprising here so far. Where does it get bad? Where's the, this is all just typical engine stuff. Dependency. What do you, where does it get bad? I'm trying to find, where does the, where does the switches start? All right, I guess I missed the, no, it's just when registration gets called. Yeah, okay. And when does these happen? Execute transaction. Reset transaction registration state. It's a true. Yeah, during an MSI transaction, it if has you to. Execute it, you hit true. If you roll it back, you hit false. Okay, got it. And then you reset everything. Yeah. Whew. Yep. And I haven't thought about the MSI transaction stuff yet. All right. I was trying to find the where is the part where it makes the decision 
Where is it call that calculate keep registration? Yeah, the the final. But it's called when it's actually doing when it's ending the session. Yeah, that's what I expected. Is that not, I just missed it? I mean, it, it's a static in apply, so it should be somewhere in apply. <laughs> Maybe just search for it. Yeah, what am I searching for? Calculate keep registration. Actually, it's right there. And apply unregister. It's calling calculate keep registration. But that's where it was called. That's what you're looking for, right? I guess without the command, I was looking for how that had to get wired back in, but I guess this isn't bad. So here you just calculate. I was trying to figure out, where's the registration called then? It's part of apply unregistration. Yes. Which is where we were. <laughs> Unregister. So before... Oh, it's right there. Yeah, see this. This is what I was looking for. Before it was passed in as a parameter. Yeah, to see, this method. yeah. So that's, that's not that bad. Yeah, you just had to take it out of planning and put it into, hey, when we get to this point, tell me if I should keep the registration or not. And then if the F disallow removal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I don't need to look at plan. All right. <laughs> That's better than I thought it was going to be. This is going to be bad too, right? No. It's actually pretty nice. <laughs> Eligible for cleanup. Oh, yeah. Okay. This doesn't happen very often. Core it's just cleanup. basically calculating keep registration during detect. It's essentially what it's doing. Yeah, so then you call detect, plan, and apply. Didn't mean to keep that comment in there. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. This or you need to do a to do on it, yeah. So, or maybe it gets delayed later. Yeah, I'd, I would have mm, probably not. I didn't realize I had it in there. Hmm. Okay. Okay. There it is. No, it's not. I'm going to still need to. I have to go. I want to see that one a little bit more. Yep. Right. And then this is just, hey, let's go tell the BA and let them override it. And then you added the action. No, you added the cache type here. Did you update this message to say, hey, it was marked always, but the BA overwrote it? No. Again, just trying to. No. Yeah. I don't know, should we though? Because mm. the prereq BA is going to do that all the time. I mean, mm. by, by, I don't know if we should, because we're already logging that the BA changed the default request date. Oh, OK. Then, then yeah, that's probably fine. So that's we're fine. just changing the default yeah. request date. Yeah, okay, that's fine then. Uh, 
So that was where we were. If they didn't ask to do anything with the package, this is where we were uh, making sure it got cached. Yeah. Gosh, this is much more complicated. Why didn't we just do it this way before? That's so weird. Because well, this is much easier. One reason is because this is one of the first things I did. Cache always. Oh. The oh, other, oh. the other reason is the the cache um, request date wasn't actually implemented. Ah. Uh -huh. So yeah, okay, I had to wire that out. What am I looking at here? Move sharp request stack cache. Okay. Or present. I see first of the always. Okay, got it. Um the mountains fine. Yep. Yeah, this does make things a lot easier. Yep. Yeah. What? What is that? The estimated oh, oh. size. U L L. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's the weird um what is it? C plus plus CLI. It doesn't infer the uh, type. Um, generic type. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, I'm not logged in here. Um, I'll get on another window. Oh, where I'm logged you don't. In. You don't have to merge it. Yeah. I need to do other things. Okay. You're gonna. You're gonna tweak. Right. You're gonna tweak that comment. Um, delete the comment. All you right. Need to update the BA to with the. Message is deleted. Got it. So it's not ready to go, but it's definitely ready to be reviewed. No, that's good. Um, the orphan compatible MSI package, I'm still like, what is this? Which is the same thing. You know, it's like, oh, bugs me a little bit. But everything else, it's pretty good. It's better, better than what I thought it would be. It's good. All right. After all that fun, has Bob gone to sleep on us? No, I'm awake. <laughs> Relaxed. Relaxed. All right. Uh, we're closing in on, well, we're at 45 minutes ish. Um, anything else? An hour and 45 minutes ish. Oh, man. An hour and 45 minutes. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, anything else you guys want to talk about? Stuff. We will pick up on the design discussions and again in two weeks. Hopefully by then I will be through my list and we'll be ready for mine. So maybe I'll push my question to the front next time. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> that would be the 18th of February. I think that looks right. We can do that. Sounds good. Same time. Same yeah. place in two weeks. Uh, sure. We'll do all this again. Um, that was fun. It's nice to see uh, the big things that we discussed from a while ago, particularly ones that were contentious, like how can we do this, can we, should we, you know, to see it come together in a nice little block of code, you're like, yeah, no, that arguably, I think most of that makes burn better. Um, so that's uh, uh, it's not just more. A lot it, of code. Exactly. It's better. It's not just more. It's better. Like, especially that last change we looked at with the cache always. I'm like, yeah, that's a nice cleanup. It's just more consistent with the way everything else works. Um, the, the way that BAs can override uh, the engine decisions. It's consistent with everything else. It's great. So, all right. So on that note, uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, that would be February 18th. Uh, we'll do it again. On, uh, and uh, we'll see how much farther we make it into the world of Wix 4. Oh, but hey, on a happy note, everything we talked about here, Wix 4. Pretty awesome. <laughs> it's, that's a nice feeling not to be talking about Wix 3 right now. So uh, you guys have a wonderful two weeks. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.